Hello, uh, and welcome to our presentation on TASMI uh, as a tool focused on English, uh, and particularly our QCH4 product that we're just launching this year. I'm really excited about this, I have to say. Uh, from the time I developed the company and developed the, the, the product itself, um, I always believed that this was something that could make a huge difference for people who, like me, were not uh, always uh, the best at English literature and struggled to remember quotes and remember the, the ins and outs of characters and plots. Uh, and so it's, it's been a long time coming, but we're really thrilled that we've got this uh, literature package now for Key Stage 4. And t I've been testing it in the last few months. It's really uh, powerful, really exciting. Um, so thank you for taking the time to join our breakout here. Uh, I did present earlier about uh, the uh, evidence of EdTech and the, Im the importance of evidence in EdTech. There is a little bit of that in the end of this uh, presentation, but I'm going to speed through it. Uh, the real purpose of this is to introduce to you TASMI as a product that you might consider for your schools in English. And the key thing to know is, uh, we, and I will go into it in a bit of detail anyway, uh, we are a product that's well known for science. We're adding English and adding maths this year for Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4, all included in the same price. So we're trying to greatly increase the value proposition, if you like, of what we're offering without increasing the cost. Um, so that's just worth saying at the top. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Murray Morrison. I'm the founder of TASMI. I built the program originally for my students from its origins as a card game into uh, an elaborate spreadsheet into the piece of ed tech that we have now. Um, I also direct education research at TASMI, so I'm very interested in how it works and measuring that. Um, and that was the purpose of the earlier presentation. Um, also, Chris, who is not presenting this presentation, but who is uh, available for Q&A and would be your first sort of point of contact if you were looking to try the program in your school or try it again if, you're, if you've used it in the past. Um, he's the main person you'd be speaking to. He is an ex-head of English um, and uh, is himself like particularly excited about the power that this sort of science, previously known science program can have in his subject. So he'd be the person to talk to as well. Um, so first of all, uh, for those of you who don't know the program, uh, we are pretty well known in the, in the UK as an education technology product, um, but uh, if you haven't seen it before, the simplest way to describe it is it's an app that students use on their phones. Um, it's very efficient, uses very little data, and allows them to do sort of daily practice or homework on the go uh, for 10 minutes a day here or there as they go along. Um, <clears throat> It's also a, a web app, so it can be used on a, any, any computer, of course, uh, and often schools use it in a sort of dedicated lesson or lunch times. Um, we're used around the country. We're well recognized as being the kind of one of the leading pieces of ed tech in terms of evidence-based, research-based product development. Um, we work with the Institute of Education through Educate, um, as, among other organizations, to sort of develop our product. Um, so as well as being this, I realized... Um, my face is uh, covering that, but you can imagine it's a phone screen with some quizzes to do. Students use our, our app or our website to do daily low stakes quizzes. This is crucially like high frequency, low stakes quizzing that adapts to the student. I think the next bit of the slide is gonna say that. The questions are designed um, to specifically tailor to each student's needs, fill in gaps, kind of detect weaknesses and sort of fill in those gaps and help them improve in terms of their knowledge recall and their ability to sort of assimilate that knowledge and apply it in other situations. And we also, not in English right now, but we are gonna be developing it, throw in videos when they're sort of shown to be uh, likely to be impactful. So if we know a student's gonna struggle in a particular question, we'll show them a video that's gonna really tailor to that bit of knowledge and then, and then quiz them on it. So we have a bit of um, delivery and, and summative assessment going on as well. But it's really a formative assessment tool that as well as allowing teachers to see who's done their homework and that kind of thing on their dashboards, and, you know, they can click on a tile and see who's meant to be in detention or whatever. Um, the main reason for this obviously is to, is to monitor activity, make sure you're getting the best out of the product and be able to, you know, selectively praise students who are engaging well. It also gives you phenomenally powerful data on exactly who's struggling and where. And forgive me, these uh, screenshots are obviously very science-y, uh, a relic of our, of our science-based past, um, but you can imagine as an English teacher seeing all of your students in your class cross-referenced with their knowledge of a particular play or book, 
who's struggling in which areas, and being able to click on orange dots and find out exactly where a student's struggling, what mistakes they're making is enormously exciting. And as a self-setting, self-marking homework, it just allows your teachers to be able to spend less time setting and marking and more time looking at that data and giving like real one-to-one -one intervention or group intervention where needs needed. You also get data as a school leader. Um, again, my face is over it, but you can see the, the grid there of colored dots. This is like class by class, who's engaging well. You can see in this case, real data incidentally, um, the engagement's going up. It's getting more and more green week on week. Um, and you can even aggregate that across schools if you're in a mass and see uh, from one school to the next, which ones are engaging better um, and just allows you to have better accountability and, and make sure you're getting value for money out of the product. You know, if you trial this with us and you trial it for half a term, which we allow you to do freely, you can see then, okay, we're getting good use out of it or we need to kind of get more out of this trial or, or we're just not engaging with it, we won't buy it. Um, so you get that kind of data as well. Uh, but the really exciting bit for me is the dots you can see on the right of the screen where you can really get uh, very good uh, drill down information about where students are struggling in the class. Tuscan is used in around 500 schools, including here at St Thomas the Apostle School in South East London. I can remember these in the exam and it does help a lot. Sometimes maybe my mum will think I'm playing around, playing games with my phone, but I should do in Tuscan. Students were putting in an hour, an hour and a half, some students three hours of revision a week, and then seeing that their results actually were slowly uh, improving. It didn't happen overnight, but those results started to creep up, and we were generally surprised at the end of the day uh, how well some of these students uh, performed. As the questions get progressively harder, I feel myself getting challenged, which really helps with my revision. And I've seen results with my mocks, my recent mocks, so it is really helpful. Yes, I've seen a big improvement in my grades and in my way of remembering things. I'm able to remember um, bits that I w normally would forget on a repeated basis. I can't imagine not using Tassimai because it's really interactive and actually fun to use. In building our programme, we've used methods identified by academic researchers as the best ways to learn. One of Tassimai's key principles is that practice makes permanent. And you can take a lot of inspiration from the way athletes and musicians go about this. There's a good quote which is that an amateur practices until they get something right and a professional practices until they can't get it wrong. That's what we're trying to get you to do with your revision. So when I opened my results, I was really shocked, very happy. Um, I managed to get an eight in chemistry and sevens in biology and physics, which I wasn't expecting at all. I certainly would recommend it to another school. I don't know if I want to though, because uh, we're quite high on the school league tables. So maybe you want to keep it a secret. Tasmai isn't a silver bullet. Academic attainment only happens with dedicated teachers and willing learners. But what we can offer schools and families is a method, a programme that's shown to improve attainment. And in the right hands, it's extremely powerful. So as you saw there, we've been well used, and I mean well used in many, many schools around the country as a science resource. And we've seen lots of evidence of how TASMA has been able to raise attainment for students and you know, also deliver genuine progress improvements that students, wherever they start at academically in terms of their attainment when they start using the program, through regular practice, their attainment grows. And we're expecting to see the same thing, in fact, more, you know, more pronounced um, indications of the same thing in English, where there really, uh, we don't believe, has been anything quite like TASMI in, in GCSE English for kind of raising basal knowledge and ability to apply it. And I'm going to show you kind of how that works. First of all, just a couple of sort of testimonial dots. You can see if you go to our website, lots more of this kind of thing where teachers, parents and students can attest to the impact it can have when re used regularly. And used regularly is really important that it's part of a sort of daily homework. It's going to give you the best sort of um, teacher workload impact as well as the best academic impact if it's just sort of embedded. Um, we've, we had a testimonial here from a teacher using TASMI for her intervention at Key Stage 3, um, particularly with students who were, were you know, struggling more academically um, and seeing how the Key Stage 3 English and Maths and Science package working in an integrated way um, had a kind of really nice impact uh, interdiscipline, uh, inter interdisciplinary as well as within specific topics, that it just seemed to really drive up attainment at that school. Um, so, based on the 
evidence we had from our Key Stage 3 product, the feedback we had talking to English and maths teachers as well as science teachers, we were confident that if we developed the English and maths Key Stage 4 products, they would be uh, really effective, they'd do a job, and they'd really add value to the product that we already offer to schools. So we've been and done it, we've spent a lot of time doing so, um, and the purpose of this presentation is really to look a little bit about TASMI for English and the impact it can have. So you can see here a little screenshot of a fill-in-the-blanks Macbeth quote. Um, it's, it'll be one of many questions that kind of form around the ideas of Lady Macbeth's character, the words she say that indicate that character, and so on. So it's not just simple multiple choice. These, these questions really do connect. Uh, you'll notice as well, we're also building content for a number of texts that are less commonly taught. We're not just focusing on an inspector calls Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet and so on. Uh, we are building content for other texts so that hopefully your teachers have a little bit more confidence to pick some of those as topics to teach or even to pick for the exam, knowing that TASMA is there to support students' sort of practice and, and retention of the material. But anyway, our questions and our content is written in this sort of diagnostic adaptive format. That is, it's a formative assessment program but the formative part is being fed directly and very quickly back into the algorithms itself so that it personalizes to the students. So job one is to make sure students know the basic knowledge. So make sure they know the quote that you see on the screen here uh, and that they can recall it over increased uh, intervals of time um, so that it really works into long-term memory. If we find gaps, we scaffold content and bring in explanatory questions that help fill in those gaps uh, and provide instant feedback, more detail on that later on. Um, through the data we give teachers, it allows you to be far more streamlined uh, in the uh, work done to you know, plan intervention or even select students that should come to particular intervention classes. Um, it overall raises attainment. We've seen it happen in science. We'd love to see it happen in English and we're confident that it will do so. Um, and uh, as a sort of accountability tool, it provides you with lots of data that you can export, download, and, and look at to make sure students are engaging well um, and, uh, and so forth. So that's what it is, what it does. Uh, how it does it uh, is, is kind of a uh, little bit more interesting to me. So although I taught science and I taught maths for years, um, my obsession was not teaching and learning. It was uh, my failed career as a jazz musician and international athlete. Um, I got to stand very close to lots of very talented athletes and musicians without actually being one myself, but I learned a lot from them, um, particularly the importance and power of hard work and good practice over uh, talent. It's, it's, you know, it's far more important really to have the kind of work ethic and the, and the approach to learning and practicing. So I really studied how brilliant musicians and brilliant athletes did that work, the kind of um, practice they did, and this fundamental idea of practice making not perfect, as you might be sort of saying to yourself, but practice making permanent. Um, my coach used to say to me, somewhat frustratedly, uh, an amateur practices until they get it right, and a professional practices until they can't get it wrong, and that's the approach I built into TASMI. It's the idea of practice to mastery, um, but doing it very much in a way that empowers the student themselves, rather than it being something that is constantly you know, being done to them. It's something that they're doing themselves. So we'll look a little bit at how it works um, spiritually, if you like, what's going on really under the hood. Uh, people often say, oh, TASMI, isn't that just multiple choice? As if just multiple choice is a bad thing. Well, it's a great thing if you write questions well and you develop algorithms that react well to responses to multiple choice. Um, essentially, although it's multiple choice, it's simply a device to drive engagement. Students have to read the question to answer it, so they're going to engage in the content. It's a textbook in disguise, but it's then much more powerful than a textbook. I don't know if any of you are of my generation, I remember those books where you had to sort of go to paragraph 243 and then you decided if you're going to turn left or right and then you'd go to the, flip the page. I can't even remember the name of them. Um, but those books uh, are, are a little bit like the way the algorithm works in TASMI. Uh, every response a student gives directs the algorithm to, to change the way it's going to, it's going to sort of serve content to them in future. But by making them engage in content, it's engaging the learners in the reading. It's all very well having a resource that's full of 10 minute long videos and you ask them to watch them. Students are going to tune out just as I'm sure you watching this video are likely to tune out. You might be sort of standing away from your screen making a cup of tea. Are you really paying attention to what's being said? Uh, understandably, I'm not the best presenter. Uh, perhaps not. If we were constantly asking questions and you had to respond all the time, you'd be pretty sure to be engaged. And that's how TASMI works. 
Um, but then the other area of this that's important is task my multiple choice content is what I would call atomized content. It's broken into such tiny pieces that it can really assess finer points of knowledge and be extremely reactive. Every response allows it to, to sort of turn on a dime, as you might say, um, and, and really kind of tailor to students as, as, it, as it's revealed. Um, we, sort of, we insist on mastery before progression. We're not going to unlock tougher content until we're satisfied a student has mastered the basics. But if we know they are very able in a topic, an area of content, then we'll speed them right on to the tougher stuff and see if we can find you know, areas to pick out and drill into. And then the other aspect is the content's laser focused. It's designed for the platform. It's designed to run on the platform and perform well pedagogically and academically uh, and impact wise. It's focused content. It's not one, we're not one of these platforms that just hoovers up any content we can find from other from other places in public domain and you know forget about QA or or uh, uh, appropriateness for the platform. No, our content is really focused on the requirements of the board, the requirements of the novel or, or play, or the requirements for the pl that the platform imposes on making content effective. Uh, so our multiple choice format we're very pleased with because it really allows the product to deliver and I should have said there as well it really is like a, an accessible tool with low data requirements students can get it on their phone they can spend 10 minutes and cover an enormous amount of content in 10 minutes that they couldn't do if they were watching two five minute videos um, so feedback I mean no learning happens effectively without effective feedback uh, I used to be maddened by the idea that I'd set homework for a student and then I might receive it a week later and then they might receive my mark a week after that and then what's the good of that feedback? It's limited particularly for students who most need that feedback. Every question you answer on TASMI gives immediate correction. If we react to that student to boost and stretch uh, in areas where they're showing improvement and the converse of that being that if they show a gap and they, they, their feedback is immediately to give scaffolding content that helps explain their concept, I'm going to show you an example of that. Uh, then likewise, we can bring in instructive videos. We don't have any for English yet, but I'm talking to uh, a friend of mine who has um, you know, been fourth wall painter in Wolf Hall and things like that, done a bit of Shakespeare. Um, he's going to hopefully help us film some videos that help um, students unlock their knowledge in English. Uh, and we're working with a few teachers as well to do some videos. We have science videos. We know they're impactful. We know they're super impactful. So we're going to be building them in English too uh, to give what we call preemptive feedback because they often come in before the quiz. Uh, then other aspects of, of feedback are less obvious, like our ability to space and interleave the repetition of content um, to make sure students are able to um, you know, convert um, a, a mistake into a correction, a correction into a confirmation, short-term memory into medium, into long-term memory, into kind of solid knowledge. That spacing and leaving into our, uh, in, uh, algorithm operates at all levels. I'll show you how. Um, and finally, the most important bit of feedback is the teachers in the classroom. We provide them with the data that allows them to really focus their attentions on the people who need it in the topics they need it without wasting a ton of time setting and marking assessments and doing their own analysis. Um, so, a little bit of detail of what's really going on. TASMI did actually start as a card game. It was a kind of a pan-dimensional lightness system, as I said in another presentation earlier. Um, we know that, uh, that the, the way those cards are shuffled, or actually they're never shuffled, I hate that word, they're, they're selectively ordered, uh, the way that the cards are shuffled allow us to optimize the education experience for each learner. So here's an example of a quiz card, like a flash card that we might put in the task my question. Um, forgive me, I'm not an expert on Romeo and Juliet, but I uh, have seen it once or twice. In Shakespeare's play, Romeo's character could be best described as changeable, resolute, constant, or sanguine. And we will have questions also that explain such fancy words as sanguine. Um, now, let's say we don't know the answer. I'm going to have a guess. And I say, well, that looks like a word that might be the answer. And I guess sanguine. Well, it will give me the correction. My presentation won't, but you can imagine it will immediately flash up, not sanguine, actually Romeo is changeable. Now, where's the therapy beyond that correction? Well, first of all, you'll see that question again. But next time you do this quiz on, on characterization in Romeo and Juliet, it will also bring up this question. Now, this one tells you the answer to the previous question, right? Uh, Romeo's line about someone in Act 2, Scene 3, I have forgot that name and that name's woe. This shows us that Romeo is changeable. Who's the person he's talking about? Um, it's a slightly convoluted question. I have actually sort of edited a question for the purpose of this presentation. Um, 
so the answer is rosin, let's say we or rosaline. Let's say we know that answer and we answer that correctly. Now that's a good sign. It's still going to ask that again, and it's going to bring back that other question. Romeo's character is changeable. It's going to really drill that and make sure students know that fact about that character. But let's say we're kind of really mastering that content now over time. It's going to bring in a bit of a synthesis question that might combine a couple of other aspects. Now it's leaving the changeable bit behind. It's telling you uh, who the quotient book is about now, and you have to fill in the blanks here. So you have to fill in, I have something that name and that name's something. I've remembered, forgot, loved that name and that name's woe, sadness or joy. And you've got to sort of pick both things. Let's hope that uh, we've got them right. I think we have. Um, and there we can move on. So the, the system is trying to reflect each answer from each student in the way that the contents then later serve to them. And it's doing that careful ordering, not shuffling of cards in the deck here. Um, for each student based on the number of factors. So it's ordering them based on recent errors. It's, it's, it's bringing back corrections for, to be made. It's elaborating on an error with a question that hopefully fills in the blanks, like the example I just showed you. And then it, uh, once you've mastered it, it asks you to confirm that knowledge over increasing time differences, dis distances. It's tailoring for difficulty. It's scaffolding the content or stretching you where you're showing improvement. And it's, it's using a sort of recency bias to make sure that that feedback can be actioned quickly and then later that knowledge is moved into long-term memory. So it alters for all those different reasons and it's shuffling or carefully ordering that deck among many other decks. And this is just within the play of Romeo and Juliet. They'll be doing it for, you know, an inspector calls if that's your modern play um, and Animal Farm. And it'll be doing all that shuffling within all those topics, within all those plays, and between English, maths, and science that all might be running concurrently on the program. And then the, the, the decks themselves are shuffled for different levels of frequency and spacing. So I might be quizzed loads on quotes, but not so much on literary devices or something. Do you see if I've, if I've got certain strengths and weaknesses? And so the way the quizzes are served really tailored to the students' needs. Now that's all kind of how it works. Um, the actual reason why it works, I think, is a little bit more um, exciting than that. Going back to my uh, analogies of, of what do elite athletes do? What do, do international music, music stars and virtuosos do with their practice? Well, it's to, it's to do with the engagement and practice and this kind of growth mindset. Now, my ugly face is going to be over the picture again, um, but that picture and the caption underneath says deliberate practice. That is an engagement in the practice mechanism yourself. I know from my experience of sitting in the black back of a classroom, you know, the teacher's going on and I'm not really engaged in what's being said. And of course, limited amount of that material goes on, uh, goes, goes, sinks into my head. Um, but the deliberate practice mechanism is really engaging me in learning. So I'm far more likely to absorb that knowledge and take it on board. Um, if, if it's part of a routine and TASMI is set as a daily homework for 10 minutes a day, that routine becomes habit habit becomes behavior, and across the school, behavior becomes culture, that old maxim, and it starts to be part of how we do things around here. Now, another thing that is, that's part of how we do things around here is suddenly my learners are engaged in their own learning. They're starting to see how, because I practiced this, I'm seeing improvement here, I'm more confident here, and also, I hate it when that quiz comes up about, um, you know, a boxer in Animal Farm, because I really, I haven't read that. Book. Uh, I have, I'm, you know, I'm weak on it, and I know I hate it. Suddenly, my thinking process starts to become more about not so much I hate that homework, but I really ought to read Animal Farm, and then I'll find my homework easier. So that kind of engagement in your own learning processes becomes so much easier to do if you've got this daily program, pro process and this daily practice program um, building the structure in. Now, although it's it's being given to the students in an app, and TASMI is doing all the organizing. TASMI, incidentally, is kind of Greek for knowledge organizer, and I organize myself and so on. The student themselves is the one that's doing the work and making the progress. No one's doing it for them. They're not being spoon-fed. Um, and so the motivation or, the, or the, the sense of achievement they get from, achieve, from, from working through the content is very much theirs and theirs to own. And as a result, when they face any kind of terminal exam or mock exam, PPE, um, or just converse with you as their teacher about the, the goings on in this, in this piece of literature or in the case of science or maths, they can do so with more confidence. And that starts to really, really boost uh, attainment and the kind of sustainability of that change in attainment. That's why I think it's really exciting. And when we see it implemented well, it's all to do with building 
uh, tie into the culture of a, of, a, of a cohort. So that's really the end of the kind of pitch, if you like, of the product. Um, and of course, departments are able to trial the program for a good few weeks and get a really good feel, not only of whether it will work for them, but also whether they will be able to implement it as designed and really get the most out of it. Um, I did present on data studies. I realize I've gone on for a long time, so I'm just gonna whiz through this, but uh, please go to our website and see our downloadable impact report. It's there for all to see. We're very strong on showing our evidence of impact. We know we're not there yet, but we have plenty to, to attest to the effect that it can have on schools uh, attainment. That one was about literally using TASMI and getting better grades. Here's one about increased use of TASMI affecting a change in attainment, which is much more the kind of thing we want to see. Higher attaining students do get a progress of on average 10% from high usage, lower attaining students even more so, which we were thrilled to see. We were worried it might not quite match that trend. Um, that was a sort of trial uh, that we did pre and post testing uh, about 1,500 schools distributed across the country in lots of different contexts and fairly randomized. Uh, we also did an RCT on the impact of our videos and showed uh, they had an impact of more than three times on, on knowledge attainment and recall. Uh, and then finally, this piece of research we just printed, presented at the ASE because it was about science results, looked at our, um, our data feedback and measured that against independent assessment, in this case, the, the pixel wave PPEs. Um, we had about 600 students participate. We looked at thousands of exam scripts, tens of thousands of answers to questions correlated to their, um, their snapshot of our, our predicting dot at the time to see does an orange dot really mean they're gonna struggle? Does a blue dot really mean they're gonna achieve well? The blue dots are all those ones where the students averaged 60 to 70% rather than the orange dots where they pretty much all averaged 50 to 60%. So they are, you know, they are averages of course, and there's noise in the data, but it's a very strong indicator that our dots are pretty good. And in fact, as good as a, as good a data source as you can find for indicating likelihood of outcome and directing your intervention. So we're very, very serious about that um, kind of impact analysis. One last point is you see, we've got two terrifying outliers there. That means we've work that into our product development and we've removed those sort of early indication red dots that we were showing. They're not red, they, they just don't tell us anything. So I think that's how we kind of modify our product to make sure we're giving you valid data. That's That's been done. So it just goes to show, you know, we're not infallible, but we, we use our research to make our product better. So that's the end of our, our sort of presentation. Um, very happy to answer any of your questions if you get in touch by email. I'm murray at tasmai.com. Um, Chris, likewise, Chris at tasmai.com. Pretty easy to find as long as you can spell tasmai. Good luck with that. It is written at the bottom of the slide. Um, and uh, very grateful to you for taking the time to watch our presentation. I'm more excited about GCSE English than anything we've done at Tasmai in years. I'm so looking forward to seeing it taken on by departments um, as part of the existing science package you might have at your school. Um, and hearing your feedback and hearing what I hope will be tremendous results and seeing your students really achieve the grades that, that you always hoped they could, they could through, uh, through this excellent sort of practice routine. Um, if you have any other questions, please do get in touch. Thank you so much for your time and bye-bye.